You're listening to the Redemption Church Podcast with Pastor Daniel Williams as we go through a series called God Redeems, a study through the book of Exodus. Oh, it is so good to be in the house of the Lord tonight and to worship Him. Uh, Tonight's message I'm calling the Covenant Renewed, the Covenant Renewed Part 1. Part one. Can't get through the whole chapter. There's so much goodness that I wanted to break it up uh, and make sure that we cover and do our due diligence in what the Lord has for us tonight. But don't worry, my friends. The plan still is to finish Exodus before Christmas. It's the plan. But y'all know the verse. Man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. So we're going to see how far we get in tonight uh, with a few verses, thinking about the nature of God. And um, man, where we are in the book in Exodus 34, it's more of the end of the book. We've gone through so much, but let me give you some contextualization of what we're going to study tonight. It's this wonderful narrative of how God has redeemed the people of God, his people, the Jewish nation, the Israelites. And we're learning these principles that God not only redeems these people, but he redeems all people through his son, Jesus. And there are great principles of redemption for us today. This is why the series is called God Redeems. And it's just been so awesome to see so much of the character of God, the character and person of Jesus in this book. And so we find ourselves in sort of another story, in the meta story of Exodus. There's all these little um, ups and downs through the narrative of this book, but this particular passage, Exodus 34, we find ourselves in the middle of a story longing to know a question. Will God forgive his people? Will God forgive his people? You see, the Israelites, they, they had sinned. And you may know this story. It's in part of this context. They got patient when Moses was up in the mountain and they started to worship a golden calf, an idol, Exodus 32. And this was a horrendous sin that the Lord said not to do. They actually had the Ten Commandments. They knew it was a sin, and then they crossed that line. They they missed the mark completely. They got in the flesh. They worship an idol. And so Moses, he's now been in this role of an intercessor, intercessor, praying for the nation and asking God, please, God, please, God, please, will you forgive? Will you forgive? And tonight we're going to find out some incredible, amazing news, what God is going to do. He's going to forgive. And this is so important for you and I to know today. This is the God that we serve. Because the reality is, even though we are God's people, Jesus lovers, followers of the Lord, born again, we still struggle with the flesh and miss the mark. And we've learned what an idol of the heart is. And how we can give our attention and our love to not God, the creator of the universe, but so many lesser gods and other things. Even good things can become God things when you put them in the improper place. And so you and I struggle with this. And this question is not just for this text, but it's for our lives. And we're going to see tonight, God does forgive his people and he desires to give mercy, love, and grace. And he does this, not particularly because they're amazing or because you're amazing and I'm amazing, but he actually proclaims his name tonight and declares how amazing he is. You guys know that we can know who God is. And he's a God who speaks. And when he speaks, he brings forth life. And when he speaks, he brings forth faith. And you can trust him and know his name. And he's going to give us this truth. And he's going to back it by who he is. And that's what faith is. It's impossible to please God without faith. But faith is just trusting in what God has said. And this is why it's so important as a people of God to go to his word, to go to scripture, and to study it. And this is why we're in Exodus 34. Because we're just wanting to know God. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start just with the first four verses. What we always do is we read scripture, we pray, and we ask God to teach us. And so the covenant being renewed in verses one through four, I'll read it, and then we'll pray and dig into it and study. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the word that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. 
And he took his hand two tablets of stone. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much that we could enter in and that your spirit is with us. We thank you, God, that, that you help us even to pray, spirit. We want more of you, Jesus. We want, to re- we want your spirit to reveal more of who you are. As we elevate you, God, we pray you draw people near to you. Uh, Jesus, thank you that you're in our midst, that you not only died, but you rose again. That all the promises of God are yes and amen in you, Jesus. And so would you help us to see more of your beauty tonight? You're a beautiful God. You're worthy of our worship, but oftentimes we don't fix our eyes on you. And this is why you tell us to fix our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Build us tonight. Equip us tonight. Father, fill us with your spirit tonight and your truth so that we would walk in freedom. Renew our faith. We thank you, Lord, that we're in your midst, in your presence. And we thank you, God, that we can now engage with the worship of our minds and study of your word. So, Lord, with a flawed person, would you speak? Would you use my lips, the thoughts, and meditation of my heart, everything that I've received from you this week, Lord, would you be able to feed your people through it? Thank you, God, that you anoint words, that you anoint moments. So we just recognize that you're here. We make this a house of prayer. We bless you and we thank you. We honor you, Lord. And it's in your mighty name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hey guys, you could be forgiven. I want to say that again, and I think it's worth repeating over and over and over. You can be forgiven. I think sometimes we lose this fact, this wonderful truth, this good news that there is a God that forgives us. And not just like us in this room, but like humanity. Like we are not God and there is a God and there is something within our hearts that longs for eternity and to know God, but there is a shortcoming, misguidance, misstep, sin that separates us. And you sin by omission and commission. You know what to do and you, you cross that line, but you, you know what's right and you can't live up to that standard. And something in our hearts breaks and we're broken. And we live in this world where it's just not right. There's just something wrong. It's off. The Bible says it wasn't the way it was supposed to be because of this sin nature and our actions and our heart. But God wants you to know that you can be forgiven. You can be made new in Christ. For whoever is in Christ is a new creation. And what we're seeing in this chapter and throughout all Scripture is this great message, this reality of good news. Because we live some, so often in a state and a reality of bad news. We, we see the news. We know what's going on. We, we understand a verse like Romans 3.23, for all have fallen short of the glory of God, and we're like, yeah. That's clear. Things are messed up. We all sin. But sin, to define it, is flat out rebellion. It's a state of rebellion against God. It's a disposition to go against God and His truth, to live according to God's perfect and righteous, holy goodness. And we just do not, we do not hit it. We oppose God. And it leads to death. You keep on going and reading down another letter of Romans, and Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Galatians says it leads to destruction. There's heartache. There's there's bad fruit. It's really bad news to live in the state that we're in. So much so, we as a culture don't even like to talk about sin. And even if you aren't religion, you don't like to talk about death. But listen, it's a part of our reality. It's something that we face. Sin and the wages of sin, the Bible says, there's a weight to it. And you must pay for that weight. And there is a righteous, holy judge. Things that we don't like to talk about, about eternal damnation or hell are realities, and we must face this. Whether we ignore it here or now, God will make us face it one day when we see Him. You see, because ignoring sin doesn't take sin away. Ignoring sin just leads to more sin and more death. In fact, this is why God gave us the law 
as Moses is saying, hey, you know how you had those stones? Well, come back up. You need to actually not ignore this issue. This is so important. You need to know it. The purpose of the law was to reveal our sinful state. It was never to save us. It was to show us God's holiness. In fact, the apostle Paul said the law wasn't bad. It was like a mirror, but it reveals our hearts, which are bad. So we as humanity, we we're stuck in this horrible place, deserving death, wrath, punishment, separation from God. I just want to know as a Christian, have you sat in that lately? Because it seems like if you can identify the problem, you can try to go after it and fix it. But oftentimes as Christians, we're fighting against the flesh or things that are seen and not recognizing the things that are unseen. Like we sang, I raise a hallelujah. That's the weapon. That, that's a prayer thing. That's a spiritual discipline. There's, there's something more to than what just the world or news or your friends or whatever the culture is saying. There's biblical truth for us to combat the realities because God wants us to live in reality. He says the truth will set you free. You see, we don't deserve heaven. We deserve hell. But God, the Bible says, in His mercy... And in his grace, through his love, he, he saves. Let me say it again. He forgives. It's not that he ignores this reality. He overcomes this reality. He conquers this reality. He's victorious. He's greater, the Bible says, than our sin. That's how his grace works. And he invites us to face this harsh reality, this bad news, with some good news and to receive, as Moses is getting an invitation, to come back up to the reality that this nation needs God. God would invite you, or Jesus would invite you. Come, all who are heavy laden and weary. I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I, I want to I transform you. I want to make you new. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless you're spiritually alive. And sin makes us spiritually dead. How do we enter into that? This is why Jesus came. To, to save us from our sin. We talk a lot in church. Like, we're saved. We're saved. What are we saved from? The punishment of sin. Our own mess. And we can be forgiven. This is what this text is saying. This is an invitation. The heart of God in the middle of this mess. He's saying, just come back. To just receive grace. Jesus died to pay the record of debt for us to give us his righteousness. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus that he saves, that he forgives, that he redeems. And this, this story is not only in God's people in Exodus 34, but it could be your story as well. You can actually know forgiveness. You can know the heart of God and you can accept his invitation. God invites Moses to come back up to the mount to renew the covenant that the people had broke. God didn't break the covenant. Remember, he's perfect. He's righteous. He's holy. They broke the covenant. God doesn't break his word. We break it. So we have to receive forgiveness. So in verse 1, God tells Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first. The first tablets and the covenant, they had been broken. Why? Because the people had sinned. And Moses broke those tablets. And yet God is going to now renew the covenant once again because he's willing to forgive. Now, was there real consequences for their sinful actions? Yes, we've studied that. Even so much so in this context, as we jump in, they had to make new tablets. Why? Because these old tablets got broken. Right? So he tells Moses to come up to receive forgiveness. And I just want to remind you that, that your sins can be forgiven today because God provides a new covenant for us. Jesus was broken for you and I. His blood was shed and we can enter into a covenant of grace because of the resurrected Christ. And this is a beautiful picture of Jesus not only being broken for our sin, but coming back up to receive a new covenant of grace. In fact, Romans chapter 1, verse 4 says this, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection. Because Jesus rose and God 
rose him from the dead, you and I know we can have this new covenant and actually forgiveness of sin. Because what God says goes. And my God making a new covenant with him and renewing this covenant, it's the same principle. God will not disappoint. But Moses had to go. Moses had to go. The sin was real. So was Jesus' death to forgive us. And because God raised Jesus from the dead, the covenant of grace will always speak on our behalf. We are forgiven. We're forgiven. I mean, as long as Jesus is alive. And they already tried to take him out once. Didn't work very much. Three days later, he rose again. And he actually ascended to the Father right now as interceding and praying for us. And has sent His Spirit so we wouldn't be orphans, but have the Spirit of Christ in us so we can learn about Him and know Him and walk with Him. The old covenant was based on the law, which reveals our shortcomings, but this new covenant of Jesus Christ based on grace, well, we can receive forgiveness through it and we can accept the invitation. So God says, Moses, come up to the mountain and we read in this text, But I feel like God wanted us to know, hey, go to the, go to the, go to the mountain of, of Calvary. Go to the cross of Christ. We have an invitation too. When we read this story, we can see God's heart and we're going to see more of it as he reveals himself to us, this beautiful invitation for who he is. Come to the cross. Come to the mountain of Calvary. We, just like Moses, we can see the glory of God. Now, verse 5 picks up this story where we looked at a lot of these things of why the mountain had to be separated and holy because God is so holy. And that's what our salvation does. It doesn't just wipe away our sins, but it gives us God's righteousness and makes us separate, holy. God uh, uh, imputes His righteousness to us so we can have the presence of God. When you put your faith in Jesus, sin is separated, and then you become actually holy, born again, and the Spirit of God dwells with you, and you can experience God. And I think sometimes when we go to the verses like this, we think like, well, that's Moses, and I wish I can see God and be in the mountain. No, we have the Spirit of Christ, and you can have a relationship with Jesus through his cross. And so verse 5 says this, that after the invitation, Moses, well, he went up as the Lord commanded. He took in his hands the two tablets, and then verse 5 says, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. We can stand with God there through the cross of Christ and be in His glory. Have you ever thought just how glorious it is to have a relationship with God? First, we take advantage and as Christians. We just don't even think sometimes about how amazing it is that we should just revel and just be enthralled by the gospel and how glorious it is to just have our sins forgiven. But then God imparts and imputes his righteousness on us and gives us his spirit and all spiritual blessings are in it. And now, like the Bible says, you can talk to God and he'll listen to your prayers. 1 John 5 talks about you could have confidence. Your, your, your prayers don't just hit the wall. They go straight from heaven and all of heaven moves when we actually pray. Just like as Moses prayed for these people, God uses us to intercede and be his royal priesthood and pray for people and represent him and walk and have the purposes of God. And he's given us gifts and talents and this time is just a gift. And he does this by his grace and he proclaims to us this truth, not only in Moses, but throughout scripture. We can be in the presence of God now. Because we've been forgiven. And we've been forgiven not because of how great we are, but how great God is through the invitation. One commentary I was reading said this, because of the work of Jesus, the righteousness of God is satisfied and the grace and mercy of God are righteously given. Man, this is just such a glorious act that, that we should marvel in that God met Moses on the mountain with his presence. And Jesus wants us not to take this for granted because so much so, he actually tells us, if you have a relationship with him, to revel, to enjoy, to marvel at the presence of God and then tell other people they could know God as well. You know, when we talk about evangelism, I was reading stats and they said like, You know, most millennials now, they actually think evangelism is like a bad word, that we would tell other people about Jesus. 
They're being deceived and caught up and lied. It's the best loving thing that I can tell people that they could know Jesus, that they can have their sins forgiven. Is there bad news? Yeah. And guess what? Whether you tell people or not, they're living in that because that's their reality. But we have eternal truths to tell people, you could know Jesus. You can be forgiven. You can have your sins wiped away and cleansed, and you can actually know God and walk with Him because God loves you. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.18, all of this, speaking of salvation and forgiveness and redemption and our righteousness, is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Our mission as a church is to pursue and to proclaim Jesus, to make disciples. It's pretty simple. Love God, love other people. But how often do we forget the glories of these truths until we take a step back, look into the scriptures of a story like 3,500 years ago about one guy meeting with God and then he's glowing and just being used by God in mighty ways. And we're just like blown away. Like, this is an incredible, it's an amazing story. The Bible says that you could be a living epistle. That people are watching your lives. That God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That, that he wants to work in these ways. And so this is why it's so important as we study God's word to take these eternal truth and these principles to look to the person of Christ and to understand, wow, God can do that with us. He not only invites us, but what did Moses have those two tablets for? To write the law down and then what? To tell the people, this is who God is. These are his laws. He doesn't want you to forget. Why do you think that God would save you and not do the same thing? The things that you're learning right now, you should be discussing in community groups with one another and saying, this is what Jesus is teaching me. And when you're at work, you should, this is what Jesus is. Hey guys, did you guys know you could be reconciled to Christ? You can have your sins forgiven. You can have mercy upon God. You can know Jesus. You can know your creator. You've been made for this. Why are we not more excited about evangelism? We need to receive from the Lord these truths. Because the primary way that we do this is knowing who God is for ourselves. That's why we say ministry is an overflow of our heart. And notice how God revealed himself in this text. It was through his word. He proclaimed his name. So in verse 6 and 7, man, it, it passes, he passes by Moses. He proclaims his name of who he is. And remember, this is an answer to Moses' request. I just want to encourage you guys because sometimes I just feel like I'm, I'm alone in this. I've been praying for revival for years. It's the only reason I'm here in Delray Beach. Like God sent us to plant a church for revival and spiritual awakening, and I hunger for it, and I fast for it, and I long for it. But God shows up where he's wanted. And in Exodus 33, 18, Moses had a prayer, and God is answering it. Moses prayed, God, please show me your glory. This is an answered prayer. If we ever are going to see revival, our friends, our neighbors, this community change and people get saved, we got to keep on praying. We got to keep on going. And now God is answering this request by his word and revealing his nature. One commentary I love, Christ-centered commentary by Tony Murda in this section, he said this, we get a glimpse of God's glory when we get understanding of his name. We get a glimpse of God's glory when we understand who God is and have that revelation from the Spirit. Can we just ponder on this for a minute? Do you really believe this? Do you see what's happening? I want to see your glory. And God says, I'm going to speak my name and reveal who I am. For I am that beautiful. I am that great. Why aren't we studying, meditating, speaking, pondering on God's word more for his glory. Not, not just for principles, but for the person of Christ. If you're reading the Bible and not looking to Jesus, you're doing something wrong. You should be asking God, what does this teach me about you? I want to know you. I want to know your glory. And that's why I'm going to God's word. What, what do we do when God reveals his glory? And we see God do this to Moses through his word and he still does, does this today to reveal himself. This is why as a church we value going through God's word. 
even if it's slowly sometimes. You know, it takes a few messages to go through Exodus. That's all right, because we're about God's glory here. Not a cute sermon series, not a cute message. This isn't the Daniel show or Julius or whoever's up here. No, this is about God. And we want to know God here. And we do this through certain disciplines. We want to know God and to be in his presence and to have him receive the glory. It is so valuable for you to give yourself over to God's word and have that as the final authority to study the word, to long for his presence. And man, as you do so, you will be met and he will be found. He promises that. You could pray for that. I came across this amazing quote this week. Charles Spurgeon, he's the prince of preachers, old school guy, revivalist, evangelist. And he talks and said about Christians studying the word of God. He says this, it has been said by some that the proper study of mankind is man. Okay. I will not oppose the idea, but I believe it is equally true that the proper study of God's elect is God. The proper study of a Christian is the Godhead, the highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy, which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, and the doing and the ex existence of the great God whom he calls Father. Yeah, I mean, he could preach a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Why aren't we giving ourselves over? If you long for the glory of God, you must be students of the word of God. You must be. You must know his name. You, you under, have to understand God reveals him, his, who he is through his word. He's revealing to Moses his glory. He's saying he's proclaiming his name, his nature. We go to scripture and we're people of God's word. Again, Tony Murda in his commentary said, Moses wanted to know God's glory more. So God proclaimed his name to him. This shows us that to know God's glory, we must know something of God's attributes God's perfections, God's nature, and he has revealed them to us in his word. I, I don't even know how to pump you up more than to get into Bible study more this week. On your own, you and God meeting and just glorying in the truth that you were forgiven, that you can ask God and be with him and God can proclaim the truth of who he is through his word. And so God proclaims his name to Moses to make sure he knows it that it's his nature and his word that forgives, not Moses. The covenant is renewed by God and his grace, not the people's works. We aren't just forgiven, but we're called into relationship. God wants us to go deeper and to know him personally. And so let's read what God says in verse 6 and 7. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord the Lord a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin but who will by no means clear the guilt visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation wow wow what a beautiful section of scripture that reveals God's nature. And this section of scripture is repeated often in scripture. Throughout the Psalms, Psalms 86.15, 103.8, 145.8, and other books of the Bible. Nehemiah, when he wanted to read the bill of the wall, gather people, let's get around who God is. He would repeat this truth. What about Joel, the great prophet, a minor prophet? Joel 2.13 would reveal this truth. Jonah 4, uh, 2, he would reveal this truth. This of who God is would be repeated over and over and over and over again. And each attribute could actually be a whole message in and of itself. But for time's sake, we'll briefly go over each section. One great book by one of my favorite authors, John Mark Comer, it was actually his very first book. He wrote a book just on this passage of scripture called God Has a Name. For all you scholars out there, I'm just saying, I'll repeat it again for all my Online listening and Linda, we're praying for your son that he would feel better. God has a name by John Mark Comer. I just told her I'd give her a shout out. Come on. <laughs> the Lord reveals his name and says, the Lord, the Lord. Yahweh, I am. I am that I am. This was the name that God revealed to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3 at the burning bush. 
God is self-sufficient. God is self-existent. Uh, he goes on to explain the attributes and full, for you to fully understand his name. He is. He doesn't need anyone to sustain him. He is the great sustainer. He is Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord, the great I am. And he says, I am a God, merciful and gracious. This is so helpful for us because how often do you have misconceptions of who God is? But God speaks and he reveals. Now see the difference between mercy and grace. Mercy is not getting something you deserve. You deserve it, but man, mercy, you, you don't get it. But grace is getting something that you didn't earn. You try hard, but you can't earn it, but God, God is gracious. And God is both merciful and gracious. To those in need, God is compassionate. To those in need, God is compassionate. He gives mercy and has compassion for us. Psalm 103.13 says, The Lord has compassion for those who fear Him. God gives mercy to those to go to Him. And just like Israel, we all need God's mercy. And to those that don't measure up, well, God is gracious. To those that don't measure up, God is gracious. God's grace is God's favor that's undeserved. There's nothing you can do to earn it. You can't be good enough. But it's freely given. It's often said grace is, is sort of just short for God's riches at Christ's expense. God gives things for us where we just don't even sometimes know that we even need. This covenant is being renewed because of who God is and He's a merciful God. He's a gracious God. This is how we are saved. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God and not a result of work so that no one will boast. The reason why God is renewing this covenant because He is the Lord. He's the Lord. And He's gracious and He's merciful. And He's slow to anger, the text says. He's slow to anger. He's patient. This speaks about the patience of God. Because those who are rebellious... To those who are rebellious, God is, is slow to anger. To those that defy Him, are opposing Him, His enemies. I'm so glad that God is a patient God. I'm so glad that He's patient with us and how He judges us and how He gives mercy and grace. He could have just taken it out. Remember, He told Moses, man, let me just start over with you. But Moses said, but no, Lord, your nature, this is who you are, as He was testing Moses. As the people fell over and over and over again, and as you and I fall, fell over and over and over again, God continues to be patient. The Lord, the Lord giving you grace and giving you mercy. He is the same God today as we fell over and over again. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise as even some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God cares for so much us that he's slow to anger. Because God is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's what the text says. This is why he's doing it. Our God is abounding. He's full of love because the Bible says that God is love. It's not even hard for him. This is who he is. He defines love. And he continues to remain steadfast with this love because it's an unconditional love, not based off of your merit and who you are. It's based off of who he is. The Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans 8. And the beautiful thing about this, he's not just loving, he's loyal. He is a loyal God that is constant, unconditional always abounding in love, always faithful, always towards you. He is faithful even when we are faithless, the Bible says, 2 Timothy 2.13, because he cannot deny himself. It's who he is. He's always going to love. To the unfaithful, God abounds in faithful love and loyalty. This speaks of the covenant 
nature of God that we should rest in His love. We should rest in His work and His faithfulness. To be in this covenant of grace, we rely on His love, not our love for Him. The Bible says we don't even love, but while we were yet enemies and sinners, He died for us. We love because we, He first loved us. And it's because of His steadfast love or faithfulness that we're saved, not our works. And we can do this and rely on His loyalty, rely on His love because He abounds in it. That word abound is beautiful. It, 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 the definition is it exists in large amounts. How much love does God have for you? It's a large amount. Like a lot. Like we'll never run out. Verse 7 says something beautiful. It says, He keeps keeping steadfast love for the thousands, or the translation says, or for a thousandth generations. Meaning this, we in our generation and in our life can never exhaust the love of God. Like it's going to go every person in every generation right now for the next thousand generations. So if you think you can exhaust the love of God, it just ain't going to happen. Let alone all 8, million, all 8 billion people right now. It's going to keep going and go, it's abounding. This is who he is. It is a always ever-present available love and the beautiful unconditional love of God has for you will never run out. You can't even separate yourself from the love of God. Even when you're running. And you hide and you rebel. Because God, it says, God forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. That's like the hat trick, trifecta. <laughs> like, I'm just not good enough. I messed up here, I messed up there. Hey, God sees your whole 360 and is like, I got to all of it. Praise God for this because we all sin and we all fall short. We need forgiveness, but God is able to pardon or atone for our sin. He gives us life and his righteousness. Another way to put it, to the guilty, God is forgiving. Yeah, the Bible says you and I are guilty, but praise God for who he is. To us, we can receive forgiveness from God because this is who he is. That word forgive it has the idea of carrying a weight. So when it says that God forgives, it means he lifts or he takes something away. This is, this is what God does with our sin. He lifts the great guilt and shame off of our lives and our souls and our shoulders, and he carries it away, the Bible says, as far as from the east is to the west. You were sinned and stained and condemned. The Bible makes you white as whole. White, pure white, white as snow. And, and forgives all types of sin. Iniquity, that, that's the wrongdoing and crossing of a line. It's a turning aside from what is good and what is right. You know it's wrong and you still do it. You know what's right and you still don't do it. God forgives you for that. Or what about your transgressions? Transgression is like a war term. It's a rebellion. You're opposing God? You, you want to go against Him, the living King? He'll still forgive you. It's a betraying the standard that God has given His perfect judgment, His holiness. And just with the cherry on top, He goes, and I forgive all sin. Just everything. All of it. That covers everything. Any type of moral failure, God forgives. Any and all types of moral failure. God forgives all of our sin as we repent. But, verse 7 says, to the unrepentant, God is just. To the unrepentant, God is just. But who will by no means, the text says, will clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children and to the third and fourth generation. To those who don't repent, to reject God, they will be held accountable. And just because God is compassionate and gracious does not mean the guilty who remain unrepentant get a free pass. No, God deals with sin. The tablets were broken. There was a consequence. 
One commentator said that the mention of God's consequences on several generations does not mean that the grandchildren will be punished for something their grandparents have done. It means that sin, as sin continues, God's justice continues. He will always make every wrong right. Every wrong right, and we will all give an account. The Bible says that Jesus will judge the living and the dead. And the Bible says that God will judge and punish all sin. And either you accept the invitation with Jesus and receive your judgment paid for on the cross, or you face God's judgment on your own. John 3.36 tells us. And so, to the unrepentant, God is just. So just as Joshua said to the nation of Israel after Moses passed away, we too should say to each generation, this is a generational thing, right? To the third and fourth generation passing this on. Choose this day whom you serve. But as far as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But every generation has to face God and understand who He is. And they must decide. You must decide. I must decide. What will I do with what God says who He is? Will I receive His forgiveness or will I reject Him? You see, by God's grace on the cross or by my own works, that condemn us. This text reveals God's nature and we could know him. Now we'll close with this, verse eight. See, I told you I couldn't get through a whole chapter with all this good text. I'm just saying. We'll finish part two next week. But here's Moses' response to all this. And Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshiped. Moses worshiped the Lord. I mean, what an appropriate response. You know, we, we study this text and our hearts should be bubbling over and, and, and wanting to, our soul connect with God and appraise Him for the goodness of God. As Romans 12, 1 says, it's our reasonable act of worship. When you hear a God that that invites you to know Him, that forgives, and, and you see all these attributes of who God is, and you know that you can have a relationship with Him, the appropriate response is worship. I was reading another commentary. He said, when we don't have a compelling drive to worship God, it is a clear evidence we don't really appreciate who He is. It's hard when you see you have a hardened heart towards God when you take for granted who God is, when God is revealing to Moses his name, he worships, but yet we know through these principles that God still reveals his name of who he is through his word. Are we going to God's word? And when we're asking Jesus to reveal himself, are we worshiping? Warren Wiersbe said, we don't read that Moses fell on his face when he saw the glimpses of God's glory. But he did bowed to the ground and worship when he heard God speak these magnificent words. The Bible says, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. My prayer is as we continue to be a people of God's word and we want the presence of God, that we would respond in appropriate worship. And you know it's not just singing, it's with our lives. It's throughout the week. It's it's telling others about Jesus. It's enjoying the relationship. It's pursuing and proclaiming Him. That God would continue to reveal Himself and, and as He promised, that we would respond appropriately because guess what? We can be forgiven. And my prayer is that you would know the forgiveness and love of God so much that it would transform your life into a new creation and you would go to the Mount of Cross, the Mount of Calvary, and see the work that Jesus did and enjoy the glory of God in that moment. You don't ever have to question the love of God because it was manifested and made known to us because Jesus died for your sin. And because Jesus rose again and will always be alive, you can have security and hope and rest in the work that he done. So just enjoy, ponder, worship, revel. What a gift that we could know this God. Let's respond appropriately and let's finish by taking communion. Pastor Julius, you want to come on up? Let's pray and as we do, we're going to sing one song and 
of who God says he is. And we'll have the elements of communion in the back table there. Feel free to grab them. This is something that is for believers. And the Bible says that as we come together and worship God, Jesus wanted us to know who he was and says, as often as you get together, remember the grace that I have for you. This is something that we do to identify with the work that Jesus did on the cross for our sins, for believers, that we, we trust that he died for our sin. His body was beaten and broken. His blood was shed for you and I. And you don't have to be a member of our church. You just need to be a Christian and identify and trust God in this work for you. And the Bible says that if you are not a Christian, do not partake. But if you want to become a Christian today, you can. You can partake in the love of God. You can enjoy the sacrifice on the cross. And you can just enjoy His glory, the person of Jesus, the work that He did. So let's pray and let's take time to examine our hearts and we'll close with a song and taking communion together. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are, for this great text, for your glory. Lord, you speak truth over us and have spoken to us. Let us respond in appropriateness. Let us enjoy uh, your goodness. God, we want to have grateful hearts. We want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for your name. We pray that we would lift you high always as we gather here, Jesus, that you would be exalted, and as we do, you would draw them into yourself. But I pray that you would save as we continue to proclaim the goodness of your name to the world and the community and the people around us. Help us to follow after you and help us to believe by faith who you are. We offer our lives, we surrender to you. We not only sing in song, but we, we want the Spirit to move us into action and into faith. Would you give us applicable things to do, to see, to speak? We come to you with humble hearts. God, may we see your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.